All right. Welcome back, everybody. It's your boy HD, and this is episode nine of Let's Talk Tech. And we have our lovely guest today, Deara Footman. She's a senior network engineer. Let's give her a round of applause, please. And that's a long round of applause. But all right. Um, yeah, so for you guys that don't know, this is my own mini intro. and She's going to give another intro. Uh, when I really got into the Black Twitter, Black Tech Twitter space, like for real, for real, when I actually started branding myself, then you always popped up all the time, uh, helpful networking things and other grievances and, and things, you know, you would talk about with, you know, your own perspective. And, you know, I saw you as a person that had the experience that wasn't um, kind of like me, like had a, a, where you like actually just went through the different levels to get where you're at and worked hard at it. So I always respect that. I can tell who's, you know, faking and who's telling the truth, who actually put the work in. So I can always tell that. But anyways, you know, I don't want to bore everybody with you, with me talking, they came to see you. So first <laughs> things first came, what's to do like this? Um, where are you from? So I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, born and raised, still live here. So crab cakes and the Baltimore two-step <laughs> are, are very prevalent in my life. Um, and I got my start actually in high school. Um, I attended the Cisco Networking Academy in high school. The high school I went to offered both vocational training they called it their uh, career pathways program and college prep. So I got the best of both worlds. Um, attended the Cisco Networking Academy there. Um, the program started in my 10th grade year. We focused on um, A plus courses at that time. So anything, the whole A plus coursework was my sophomore year. And then junior and senior year, we did Cisco Networking. So um, junior year was the, what used to be the, C, the CSENT, which was the first half of the CCNA. So it was all of that material and just kind of an intro to networking, a little bit of security as it related to network. And then senior year was the CCNA portion of um, the curriculum. And then in my second semester as a senior, we did work study. So they actually, we all had to get dressed up. We had to put together a resume and interview at different companies. We already kind of had the placements, but it was just for the purpose of going through the process. And my internship landed me at the school headquarters, which turned out to be my first job. So I think I went too far yeah. ahead, but yeah. No, no, you, no, no, you're good. You know, I like when people come in and just talk. That's cool because back home, they had this thing called a career center. And I remember they would help people get like CSEN or, or something, but it's kind of like all they did with it. They didn't use it in the sense like you guys did, like actual, like, I like to call what you guys did more so of an internship than a work study. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if I'd be off the mark with saying that, but I mean, that's the way I kind of would view it because I'm not gonna lie, I had my work studies in college and my student job, my last student job I did with like the, the IT director, I did stuff, but I didn't really do stuff. <laughs> he, he was, uh, yeah. shout out to Mr. Eddie. He ran like all the IT infrastructure and everything in the College of Business. So from, I think he designed the network and everything. Like I got thought I got to get him on here because he got a lot of experience and I, I think that's pretty cool. But uh, I don't want to get too carried away with that. So, you got your, did you finish your CCNA at the end of the program, if I'm not mistaken? No, so we, um, just because it was a lack of funding, we only got to do our A-plus certifications, and they actually offered us the opportunity to retest. So when I graduated high school, I had my high school diploma, my A-plus certification, and I was interning at the school system headquarters in the networking um, department. So during a high school which was, I think it was about three months. Yeah, the last three months. Um, we just kind of went for like four hours a day. One half of the group went in the morning, the other half went in the afternoon. I was in the afternoon group. 
So by the time I got there, I had just gotten like all the leftover tickets from the morning that none of the senior people either wanted to do or had time to do. So that was kind of my focus. And then once I graduated, I just started, I came in at 8 a.m. and just would attack the tickets and go from there and do all the stuff they didn't want to do. So lots of spreadsheets, um, lots of data gathering, talking to people. It was, it was a cool start. Nice, nice. I'm glad you said that because it's, I know like how some people, they try to view everything when it comes to moving up in work and promotions and everything else. You said something key. You did the stuff that nobody else wanted to do because we all know most people at work, man, they be bulling around at work. Mm -hmm. They be like, bro, really? <laughs> like it'd be different yep. if we ask you to do this for free but you're getting paid and right this is really unacceptable but one of the things about being a leader is doing those things that people don't want to do and that shows leadership qualities and a lot of people don't know that and they always wonder well how he was able to do this because in my situation at Optus, it was similar I know I heard the rumblings but I mean I came in from day one everybody had a clean slate everybody doing the country and i start off on night shift and just started working hard and making changes and that's how mm -hmm. i you know passed everybody and whether they thought they should do it or not you know it is what it is i mean even so like and not to go off on a tangent but it just led me into thinking about people on teams sometimes wanting to do what you know, you do or others do, but they haven't displayed that. You know, like I was tweeting right. about a guy wanting to be, you know, like level two, and he had been on the contract three years, but never displayed the other qualities that's needed to be it, but wanted right. to do it. And that's why, I, and most of our minds, like me and my my other friend, who are friends outside of work on top of level two, was like, yeah, I don't know about him. You know, he can do the work, but the other stuff he doesn't do. So it's kind of like, you know, we would like to promote from within, but I mean, when you don't show us that, it's you can't BS us. You can go BS somebody else because they don't really know what you do. Now, I've looked at what you did for three years. So that was pretty cool. Um, Let's uh, get a little bit, I uh, think a little bit more into that, that first role at the, the school headquarters. Um, mm -hmm. So how long did you, how long did you stay there and what did your role, like what was, I guess, the title of your role? And then you kind of summarize like what you did there. Yep. So the first, my first title was just kind of um, network associate. It was pretty much like a contractor role but I was still on like the school system payroll eventually I ended up moving to a contracting company which got me a boost in money um but I stayed there for a total of five years so the first two years was pretty much just me doing all the stuff the other engineers didn't want to do helping out with paperwork parsing through spreadsheets all of the boring mundane work and eventually it got to a point where I went to my manager and I'm like okay you know I feel like I've master this it's boring you know I want to get into some more projects I was always seeing and hearing about all these cool projects that were going on that was a little bit more above my head at the time but I'm like I want to get into these meetings I want to hear what's going on that's the cool stuff to me um so he was like okay you know cool go get your CCNA I'm like uh okay <laughs> um and at the time, it was also a, requ a requirement for me to go um, full time 40 hours because I was doing 32 hours and then four hours um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I was in college actually going physically going to class. Um, so that got to be a bit much. So I'm like, I want to do more projects. I want to be here the full 40 hours. What do I have to do? So he said, get your CCNA. So I started my CCNA journey. Um, I failed the CSENT three times, um, two times, I'm sorry, I passed on the third try. The first, the first time I took it, I'm like, I know I'm gonna fail, but I wanna see, I wanna get a feel for um, where I am. So I went in the first time expecting to fail and I did. I did better than I thought I would, 
So I just kind of took that score report and then started rehashing all of the stuff um, that I did bad on. So the second time I go in, I'm like, all right, I'm ready. I'm going to crush this. I failed. And I failed by like 10 or 15 points. So at that point, self doubt was like kicking in and I'm just like you know is this really for me I know I find it fun and interesting but is this really something I can do I can't even pass like the entropy level cert um but I kept at it and I, I did pass on the third time and was elated um <laughs> so took the second part I studied for the second part for about three months and I was able to pass the second part on the first try so after that I didn't get I didn't get any more um money but I was able to bump up my hours and get in on the project so at that point I was just in the mindset of all right let me you know learn what I can learn and then eventually leave here to get the money so I was just kind of started out just sitting in on the meetings just listening asking a thousand and one questions and then the senior team members just started giving me assignments they're like oh okay well you got your CCNA now go knock this out and I would go knock it out whether it was like a research task, go talk to a vendor or, hey, um, you know, we need to stage all of this equipment to be rolled out. Go upstairs, stage it, get it configured, box it up and, and we'll deploy it to the schools. So that's kind of what I started doing. And then from there, I just evolved into leading um, more projects. Nice. So when you started getting those uh, assignments, since when you got your CCNA, did you document those projects that you worked on? I did not. And I regret it when I started doing my job search. So it was all documented within the organization, but I didn't keep anything personal for myself. And I actually ended up having to go back and like think through everything I did just because I wasn't doing a good job of selling myself in interviews. Um, so I actually had to go back and rethink through all the projects I did and realize like, oh, wow, I know a lot more and have done a lot more mm -hmm. than I thought. Um, so one piece of advice for everybody out there, document your projects when you're doing them and, and keep links to any documentation you create, um, any type of SOPs, obviously scrub it for, you know, organizational information like IP addresses and stuff, but definitely keep it on hand because it will come in handy. <laughs> And you know what? That's funny that you say that. That's something that I haven't done only because I, you know, that stuff's kind of sensitive. Well, with kind of some mm -hmm. of the things you create, so it is kind of, you know, wonky when it comes to doing that. But that's definitely, that's definitely a major key because I, I tell people all the time. Not even when it comes to resumes, even when it's people transitioning. I was like, hey, what are some things you accomplished or you you did while you were working at whatever thing? And I'm like, I'm just trying to make you stand apart from the regular applicants and show them right. that you're an overachiever. And some people are like, hmm, I don't know how to coach. I said, I guarantee you did more than you thought you'd done and you didn't know it. And sometimes we go back to the drawing board and say, oh, well, yeah, I did this, this, and this. I'm like, exactly. But that's what's up. Um, so you are a network associate and what's, what are we going to put that, that timetable as, I guess, in years? Or months. How, so that was between 2010 to 2012. Then I got my CCNA and my title changed to network engineer officially. Got you. Um, and then from there, we were such a small team. It was like eight people, three of which were specialized on like phones. So okay. the traditional like POTS lines and VoIP. Um, so because we were such a small team, everybody kind of had to do everything. And it's a school district, which means not a lot of money. So right. it was a lot of, there weren't a lot of training opportunities. I mean, we were able to work with vendors to just like, hey, you know, slide us some training credits real quick. But for the mm -hmm. most part, it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no training budget. So you really had to go out and be, I think we had like a CBT Nuggets subscription, but that was about it. You had to really go out and if you wanted to learn something, do you research on your own time and spend your own money to like be better at your job pretty much. Um, so I got to work on a lot of different things, routing and switching, data center, wireless, voice, pretty much anything that connected to a network outside of servers, I got to touch a little bit of. Um, and it eventually led me into specializing into what I do now, which is more like a data center focus. 
Um, but yeah, it was invaluable experience. Like I, I wasn't getting paid much, but that job literally when people see, I've gotten jobs from at least one or two projects that I did on, from that job. People are just like, oh, I see you've done this. Walk me through the process. And I can like, and because we had so many struggles, like one thing I talk about a lot on um, Twitter is network access control. That was a horrible project there. But <laughs> we had so many problems and I saw everything that could go wrong that now when I come into an organization who's talking about doing it or in the process of doing it, I'm like, yeah, you might want to watch out for these three things. Unfortunately, that usually means the project is handed to me, but, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely something valuable. Yeah, I, I just I just smirked because I, I got I got some handed to me that, um, yeah, I probably I would tell you about it offline. I don't want to say it on here. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> so, um, besides that, so I it, I would I would associate that first experience as almost being like I would say maybe I don't know. You let me know. For example, my first sock role at McAfee, I really call it like a startup, <laughs> even though McAfee already had a name by then. But far as mm-hmm. it came to the sock aspect of it, something that was brand new and internally, they didn't know what they were doing. Would you consider that headquarters position similar to that far as because it's not a lot of documentation? Sometimes I know different startups have training, so like that, but in your case, not a lot of training. Um, limited resources, small team, you know, mostly getting your hands involved in a lot of different things. Would you consider that like similar to a startup environment to you? Um, No, because they did a good job of working with what they had. So making a dollar out of 10 cents was definitely that IT department. Because one, I mean, they had to, you wasn't getting no more money from the board. And these are things that were needed to support. It was very impressive to see Um, a lot of the stuff we were able to accomplish with the money um, that we were given. Um, I will say, I kind of look at it like my college. So instead of like going, doing four to five years at a university, I did four to five years there. I call it like my, my college of IT experience because I did get to touch so many things. And I think it built um, like a resiliency in me because I came from an organization where it was such a lack of resources as far as education, um, well, technical training and stuff. I had to go out and find the technical training. So it was, it's no biggie to me if I go to an organization and they're like, no, we're not, we don't pay for that. Or you get to go to one training class a year. Cause it's not, I know I'm going to continue to learn. Whereas I know some people who come from organizations where there's this massive training budget and whatever, they never had to invest their own money in their learning outside of whatever they did to initially get started. So when they go to other like smaller organizations that don't have the same budget, they kind of struggle a little bit. So for me, it's no biggie. I always do ask for training and when I'm interviewing, but if they're like, no, or it's only one class, I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Cool, cool, okay. Well, at least they were, you know, I just, man, uh, me and me and shout out to Town Tech, like we need to do a part two of uh, <laughs> McAfee. That's where me and him actually met at. But um, so let's move along. After that, without, you don't have to say where you worked at um, after that. I know a lot of people like to keep that you know, to themselves. So what type of, I'll say, I'll put it like this, what industry did you go to after being in like a a school specific type of industry once you left that role after four to five years? Where did you go from there? So from there, I went into federal contracting and I absolutely hated it. Um, I did that contract for about six months. And now after talking to people who have more um, contracting backgrounds, they just let me know it was like a bad contract. But at the time, it just completely turned me off from government. I was just like, nope, I don't want to work in the federal space no more. Not doing that again. That was horrible. Um, So after I left that contract, I went to, 
I guess they fall under health care. It's kind of continuing care and retirement. Um, so at this point in my career, I was thinking like, all right, let me like specialize because I was finding when I was doing these interviews, I knew all of my knowledge was a mile wide, but an inch deep. And that wasn't enough mm. to get me the type of roles or money that I wanted. So I took my healthcare, I, I'll say it, it was at um, Erickson Retirement Communities um, in, in Voight, because I had really enjoyed working on Voight at the school system. So I'm like, let me try to see if this is where I want to go. I worked there for three years. I met a lot of cool people, did a lot of cool work in the voice and video space, but it was boring. <laughs> it was just very mundane, a lot of moves, ads, and changes, not a lot of variety from the day to day. Yeah. And like VoIP is very much a set it and forget it or set it and maintain it technology. Like you're not upgrading every, every year or so. Um, you might get new phones, but you're not like ripping out the system and putting something new in. So I'm like, all right, I don't want to do VoIP anymore. And then I came across, I was there for three years and then I moved into the role that I'm getting ready to leave, which is at a publishing company. And this was more of like the startup of the comp of all of my companies. They, um, they're enterprise level, but they run like a startup. So there's like all the stuff we hear about, like you're a family, all the perks, all the free lunches, <laughs> all the latest technology. So it was really cool. Um, I moved into that role. I started out just as like a general network engineer and then specialized down into focusing on data center and security. Nice. So. Um, with, with that being said, just a little bit about the data center part. I had a brief stint where I was a knock analyst and um, we did have, this is before cloud was as popular as it is now. So they did have, I forgot what data center they used in um, downtown Dallas, but did you interact with uh, knock people as well um, in your role? So not in this role, there's pretty much no knock, no help desk. It was really bizarre to see because everywhere else I had been had at least had a help desk. Um, but our, um, they call them endpoint technicians, but they pretty much work on all the desktops, triage all the tickets, and then send them upward to everyone else. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see which way I want to go with this because you already gave us like a lot of good information and it, I guess it could tie into other things, but I'm not privy to some of the things when it comes to networking as um, far mm -hmm. as we'll do something simple as like salary rise or whatever. For people watching this that want to get into networking, uh, what can they expect as far as I want to say expect because it's different because it, it depends on region mm -hmm. what you're going to do with your job and, and other stuff but I guess we'll say ballpark like uh, for whatever type of roles what's something reasonable that they maybe could see in the entry level role so for entry level it's usually somewhere between 60 to 70 depending on the region so here in the DMV I usually see it starting at 60 to 70. One thing you do have to watch out for is the companies and how they'll play with like the titles. So they'll say a net administrator, which by definition, you're pretty much like a tier one network person. So you're doing, you're maintaining the network. You may do like some minor port configurations for users, like changing VLANs, but you're pretty much just there to, hey, my network jack's not working, you tone it out, you figure it out, you either escalate it to the engineers or if you have the ability to, oh, you just need to be on, your this port's on VLAN one, it needs to be on VLAN 23 because that's the user VLAN for that building. That's pretty much what those types of roles are. But what I've seen is it'll be titled network administrator, which comes with 60 to $70,000 pay, but you're doing engineer work. So they want you to be basically doing some type of design um, plus all of the maintain maintenance. Work. But not the right amount of money, correct? Right, right. Yeah, and I think that happens 
I think it happens in all roles and, and, and a lot of people don't know about that. Um, that's why if I'm doing sessions or even that video that I did about the roadmap to getting the cyber, I'm, I'm looking at roles and I'm telling people right now, I said, this is an entry level. I'm like, this is, this isn't. Don't be fooled mm-hmm. by what they ask you. Look at their job duties and responsibilities. That's going to let you know all you need to know. But um, okay, so we'll we'll say that ballpark because I think it's, I think in Texas it may be more or less around the same. It may be around maybe I would say, I don't know. I know, I know knock stuff. I have to ask my my um, my friend I had here. He had his first knock role. He's at uh, I think he's still at T Mobile. Uh, so I had mm-hmm. to ask him, even though technically knock is like network help this, but it's still networking in the sense that they let you do stuff um from yeah. there i guess what would the what would be like a, a median that you no know, people normally may jump to we'll just stick with dmv uh area so the medians i've seen are usually like 90 low 90s to like 120 a little shy of 120 Mm-hmm. And then the senior people just go up from there. Um, it definitely depends on the organization you're with. So obviously private sector is paying a little bit more. Um, and then you got your federal, the federal side of things, which if you get a clearance, you're, you're golden. <laughs> um, and then you have like the local um, governments, so like city governments and K through 12 education, they tend to be a little bit lower on the pay scale okay so i see a lot of people take those roles because because it you can get in it's a lower barrier of entry especially if you have a degree and you can touch a wider network so like the school system i worked at we had 200 buildings like that's a very large network for someone yes, just starting is. out on and you're going to have a lot of like rotating projects so and they're usually a little bit more complex than what you might see in like a larger organization. And because it's usually a small team, the more junior members get a little bit more exposure than they might in a bigger organization. Okay, um, that's nice. So uh, for you all that are looking to get into networking, you heard it here from an industry vet right here. This is realistic expectation guys, mm-hmm. but you gotta put in the work to get there. But let's see. So we're going to move into this because I, I never even asked you this. I think I, I did do some homework and I read through your sites and stuff, good information and good layout, easy to read, all that stuff, by the way. Thank you. That's what I was going for. <laughs> Tell us what um, motivated you to start the CCIE by 30. Yeah, so um, I started that when I was working at Ericsson, and I was just kind of like, I got to get back into networking. It had been, I think, three years at the time, almost three years, where I hadn't done any type of networking. I was solely doing phone. So, of course, you don't use it, you lose it. Um, My CCNA expired. So I'm like, all right, let me see, um, you know, what resources I can find to help me out. And I was really surprised in comparison to when I had first taken my CCNA, how much more information was out there. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I'm just like searching on Twitter and social media. And I'm like, oh, well, I didn't even, I I had wanted to start a blog, but I didn't know what I wanted to blog about. So when I saw that people like, oh, tech blogging is a thing. Yeah, let me do that. I'm working on this stuff every day. I'm writing notes. Why not do just take those notes and then transplant it into a blog and that's something that can help people so that's how it started out and then when I got active on social media it was kind of boring um because it was just all cybersecurity and coding people there was like nobody that was doing networking and I'm just like where I know there are networking people out here because they're networks so <laughs> why isn't mm-hmm. anybody on like social media so that's when I had came across um Dewan Lightfoot lab every day and I thought that was cool because not only not only was he doing networking but he was black so I'm like win-win um so I just started following him and watching his YouTube channel and then from there I found like other YouTubers some um 
a little bit more boring than others. Some were just like really mundane and like, I'm just teaching you this information, whatever. And then other people were just more into what I call like the motivational content. Like, hey, here's this cool new thing. I'm going to explain it to you in five seconds. If you want to learn more, here are some like links that I used. So over time, it grew. Um, it, I think my following now is still the majority of like cyber people, but there's definitely like way more networking people, which is really cool. Cool. Let me give you and Dewan some gunshots just because I think y'all are two of the few that I do on see that has to do with networking on Twitter and you do have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I haven't put anything up there yet. I mean, I'm going to plan to do that over the summer. Streets but, need yeah. that. I think you got some gunshots. <laughs> the streets need that for real. Um, if you need some help with that, let me know. Uh, that's one of, another thing I plan to do. I just want to help people with with stuff like YouTube, and I probably need to reach out to you about blogging stuff because it's hard for me to stay consistent with blogging because I got so much other crap I'm trying to work on. So that's the hardest part. Like mm -hmm. filming, filming is easier because I can just talk. I'm good at talking, and I know how to talk yeah. up my stuff. But when it comes to blogging, writing something now, I have to have a concept. I have to make it make sense and draw together because the most recent one I did didn't start off like that. I had to, I was sitting on it for a couple of weeks and then I just got in one day and really just started rearranging stuff and, and tweaking it because I was like, yeah, I think it needs to go this route. Because well, I had it titled and kind of what I was going to wasn't really make sense, but it got good reception. Gotcha. So that's good. And since I brought that up, how do you stay consistent with your, like keeping up with your blog? Blogging? I'm nowhere near as consistent as I should be for two reasons. One, life. Um, and a lot of times I'm struggling with finding balance between learning for work and also pursuing my goals. So uh, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. Um, I unfortunately don't control um, what my company decides to invest into. So sometimes it's Cisco stuff, sometimes it's not. And I got to take a step back and, and learn it. So another reason I kind of slowed up on blogging was I found myself spending, devoting a lot of time to my blog and um, being active on like social media. Twitter is pretty easy because Twitter is pretty conversational. And I can just mm -hmm. kind of do that. Like I'm on the train, let me fire off some tweets or, you know, right. I'm waiting for Uber. Let me fire off some tweets. I can kind of do that in my past time. Whereas like creating content for something like Instagram is a little bit more time consuming because I want it to look nice and mm -hmm. like not just a bunch of random pictures. And then if I'm doing like videos from work, I have to go back and like take certain stuff out. Um, edit it out so that it's, I'm not giving away too much like proprietary information. And my last role had um, some interesting social media clauses and an NDA. So I had to be very mindful about like what I recorded and posted. Um, and then for the blog and just everything as a whole, I just was like, I'm, do I'm dedicating so much time to this. And everybody was like, you should be like getting paid. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> um, so I was just, and I'm, I'm still in the process of this, just kind of researching, like potentially doing different partnerships and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. what that might look like versus doing like courses. And I reached out to a couple of people in the Twitter community who do courses and work with like places like safari and linkedin and stuff just to kind of figure out like how did you like get there like what like how do i take this massive audience i've built and like monetize right. it right. so i follow um ari ari hale allergic to hourly um okay and yeah, was I just like i should have gotten her conference she had man i didn't it slipped up on me but i heard it was nice yeah, I followed her like all last year when she was just putting out a lot of her free marketing content and I have like a whole notebook full of the notes. So like I know how to market the stuff. I just have to find the stuff to market. And then something else 
it's just balancing like free versus paid content. So yeah, I think it gets to a point where you, you, you know, you're spending, it starts out like, oh, hey, let me go find some people that have the same interests as I do or like a study group or whatever. And then you kind of keep at it. And next thing you know, you've built like a platform. I, at least for me, I didn't intend to build a brand. It just happened. Um, and now it's like, okay, well, I'm spending so much time doing this. I should get some sort of benefit out of it. So I've been trying to, I have some experimental strategies together. So we're going to see like what pops. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um but I think I want to keep the content on my blog uh free so a lot of like stuff I struggle with starting out so like how to study and what are good study resources and like just quick little how to like you're in the middle of doing a configuration and how do I set up a trunk port like stuff like that so I want my blog I know for sure I want my blog to go in that direction I just have to figure out like what I want to do with the rest of the stuff that was nice, a very long nice. answer. <laughs> so before we get into the fun stuff, for people who's watching this, if they want to learn how to start their career in networking, what would you advise them on doing? Because, you know, these are some of the conversations we see on Twitter all the time. And I think uh, no one better than you to go ahead and give that advice on what they should do. Yeah. Um, if you're transitioning from my typical rule of advice and a lot of people don't agree with this but it's what I've seen work is if you're coming from a non-technical background doing the uh, net plus first because it gives you a broad vendor neutral overview of networking so that'll really like lay a solid foundation for the CCNA because contrary to what a lot of people think I don't think the CCNA is an entry-level exam it's definitely like what the industry requires you to have, even for entry level roles, but you definitely need a base before you even like go the route of the CCNA. Um, once you do your net plus, I always recommend people get the certification, but I have seen people say, you know, just go through the material and then get the CCNA because the CCNA is, is what is going to attract recruiters to you. But I'm, I, I say, if you're going to spend the time studying, go all the way and get the piece of paper. Like, that's just my philosophy. It can't hurt you. Um, then get your CCNA and then um, look for knock rolls. That's definitely like the lowest barrier of entry. Get on a knock roll, um, work it for six months to a year, get that experience and then start looking to move. I think it's very important once you at least from what I've seen, people usually struggle to get in and get that first job. And then once they get the first job, you'll see a lot of people just get complacent. Excuse me. And then before you know it, two years have passed and they're like, yo, I need, I need to make some more money. Like, what are y'all, what are y'all doing? But you just got comfortable just showing up, answering phones or doing like the lower level work. Um, so I always tell people it, you're going to feel great once you get the first job, but that's when like game time really starts, like really go in there, focus on whatever your mission is. If that mission is, you know, let me work here for six months and then see if I can move up within the company, always good. If that's your plan, it means from month one to six, you need to be networking with the higher level folks. You need to get your name in front of them. You need to be good at your job. You need to take notes, ask questions, all of that. Ow. So then by the time, <laughs> that takes me out every time. Um, so then by the time you're ready to make your move to move up, you can say, you know, hey, you know, I want to, you know, join your team or get on the engineering side of things. And, you know, if they're good people and there's an opportunity, they'll be like, you know, all right, well, this is what you need to do. Or maybe it'll just be a, hey, you know what? Um, there might not be anything we can do for you at this company, but I know somebody who's hiring over at this company. If you don't get any of that, then you already know, like, all right, this isn't the company I need to be at, and I need to work the next three to six months for my exit plan, and whatever that may be. Maybe that's you taking the time to get another cert. Maybe that's just you, like, okay, they're working on this project. I want to be here to say, you know, I helped or contributed or collaborated on this project. Maybe that's what it is. But build a timeline from that point and work the timeline until you get to where you want to be. That was one mistake I definitely made. I got complacent and caught up in just learning stuff for work 
And I kind of talked about this on Twitter. I think that hindered me in getting to like six figures sooner. Um, I definitely could have gotten it sooner based on the experience I had, but I wasn't doing any more certs after I got my CCNA and I wasn't, I got comfortable at the organization I was at. I'm going to be honest. Um, it was fun. It was convenient. It was, I was learning a lot, but the pay just wasn't there. So when I was like, all right, well, I'm going to just leave. And then I'm interviewing and it's like, all right, well, you need to know these areas a little bit deeper. So have a plan, whatever you do, just have a plan and work that plan. Yeah. Um, solid information, especially with the have a plan thing. That's what I preface everything with. When I talk to people, I'm like, look, I didn't have a plan. So my path probably could have been shorter, but I just didn't know. It was one of it's one of these like many other people. They don't know to talk to. Um, when I was in the help desk role, passing by people that were like insecurity, because my first role was like uh, with a, uh, now they're actually owned by GDIT, but at the time it was uh, Computer Science Corporation. And we were kind of segmented off from all those teams. So I would talk to them and, you know, office politics prevented me from being, getting the security there too, um, just because I found out they were purposely stopping me from going. But even then mm -hmm. I still didn't have a plan. Like I just was scattershot and applying. I, just, I wasn't yeah. necessarily going out working on what I really needed to know in order to do certain roles. It's just one of the things yep. I preach heavily to people now, especially when, you know, oh, should I go, you think I should go get this service, this service? I was like, well, if you got this set plus right now, I'll say, good, now let's focus on the other stuff because all the other stuff is really not gonna help you that much because they're gonna ask right. you about what you're gonna be doing in a role. I was like, you got a foundation, you, you can understand, pretty much general security concepts. Now let's really get into the stuff that you need to learn. And I think that's some of the, I know it's like everyone's like, oh man, you're broken, you know, broken clock, broken radio, broken record. You say that all the time because it's, it's, it's pretty much that simple when it comes to that part. Because I'm not an mm -hmm. advocate for people spending all this money on learning materials. Man, you got people paying for like different practice tests and putting the time in and, all these studying, like I man, look, this is funny. Let me see if I can find it. It's a it's a guy that I, I screenshot the other day and I sent it to like one of my clients in um our Slack space. And it was only because I was like, this is what I tell my people to avoid. And mm -hmm. you no, know, hey, sorry to sorry about uh, putting your, your business out there, but I want you to tell me if you just look at this, like would you actually know what this guy is trying to do? Thank you. It's blurring it out. Let me see. Can you it see that? I see a lot of letters. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's just good enough. I could. I I'm, I'm probably gonna take his name and stuff out one day and, and share it on Facebook. I mean on Twitter because I already know people is gonna start coming on it. This dude has like all the certs, and it's one of the things that I tell people is like sometimes whatever search you get also can mess up your path on what you're trying to do. Um, the dude. Mm -hmm. I think he transitioned, but I was like, when it's really no reason when you're doing like a very entry level role, you don't need a CISSP to do that. No. This guy has that and, and some other higher level certs. I'm like, but all he got to show for it is a regular role. And I'm like, I'm not spending all that money just to be, you know, level one. <laughs> right. you know, the CISSP is more so if you're going to be management or like director type of cert, because that's what you mm -hmm. use it for. Sure, people say go get it, but I'm like, you're not going to use it on a, on a small scale if you're just going to be following tasks. So like, don't listen to them. Right. Because <laughs> that's also an expensive test too. And I think you got to pay yearly or every two years to keep it current. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's um, one of the tech Twitter topic wheels um, topics is CISSP entry level. <laughs> it comes up every few months. And it's like, no, absolutely not. And they were doing that crap. And I blame government people though, honestly. I blame them for that because I can see that they yeah. tell people that because um he was like one of my mentors but he's not in the mentor in the sense of he wasn't in cyber so he's just only going off of what he you know you got to do a dod he hears like so he the best advice he did give me is was giving me the that's to me and whether that was, that was like june of 2013 to get the sec plus so i got that but then after that 
He was like, yeah, you should get your CEH. So what I do, I go out and get the stuff and study. And then I didn't even check to see when the version was uh, changing. So I studied for an old version and ended up failing the test. But the material wasn't hard. No, CEH is multiple choice. I was like, I'm not wasting my money on that. That test is 500 bucks. And to take the oh, test, wow. they make you, I think they make you pay like a hundred bucks and you got to have like two years or three years of experience. I'm like, man, this test is a waste of time. And, and it doesn't mm-hmm. really help any it help anything. And you'll see a lot of us who are in cyber push back on people like CEH, like, nah, that, that's sort of trash. Like you can do something better with $500 and get either a couple more certs or one cert uh, instead of just wasting your money on that because it doesn't mean anything. You go in an interview, right. so I got a CEH, they can be like, okay, well, tell us about this. And yeah, I've heard pretty much, you know, people. right. <laughs> that, that's yeah. just my spiel on that because I can go all day on that. And um, also to touch on what you said when you were talking about the courses and monetizing definitely I, I i definitely feel you on that i uh like when anybody reaches out to me now and we're gonna segue into that i mostly send them hey check my blog out check my youtube channel out before i even most of the time say if you really want to book and then if they do book i always say well get the the subscription plan because it's 30 bucks but you can cancel at any time opposed to just right. doing a one call with me and then it's the same prices as that so that's one of the things um but it, it does get very time consuming when you're juggling all you got life you're working you're trying to do content you're trying to learn like last night i think i went to bed at what one or two because i was up trying to uh you know so for f- my last video I, I pretty much told people that you know i got a sock endless course i'm developing and so i'm playing with azure and i'm setting up a server so i can install some um, incident response software on there even though it was giving me the mm-hmm. blues last night we're not installing but for me to even just host it on azure you know that's 80 bucks a month right and so there's a cost a to time- like keeping all this stuff running like <laughs> it's a it's a cost for me to use Calendly to help you guys it's a I pay for my Mm -hmm. you know my outlook or how you know you guys book to pay with me my site stuff I'm like everybody they just just thinking you know I had to pay for cameras and stuff for YouTube they just thinking you know we should do everything for free which is why we're going to go ahead and talk about black tech twitter real quick <laughs> Shout out to um Black Tech Twitter though. It's actually a lot of solid individuals and in, in Black Tech Twitter. Definitely some knowledgeable ones. Then you have maybe I don't know, it's probably different types of people. I mean, you got the people that's probably riding the wave of just on there, like uh what's her name? Angie or something like that. I was talking about the people making the post talking about uh the stupid post about not being able to get into tech or something like that. Yeah. Then you got the people saying stupid stuff. And then you got the people, you know, who want to complain against their own people, trying to tell them that they charging too much. And, you know. Yeah, somebody told me I charge too much and my console call is $30. <laughs> right. And, and people should. And, and, and here's the funny thing. A lot of us make more than an hour. We actually helping people out. If we was to charge what we made an hour, you'll be like, right. man, I'm not going to pay for that. And, you know, I always tell people, like, my end goal isn't to um, just try to have you know, these enormous prices to, to make a lot of money off y'all. Because I had a guy, it's one of the things I'm going to probably talk about on Twitter one day, too, is he's transitioning and he paid for a resume before we actually went, talked about it. So it was like, I stopped and was like, dude, let's have a call because I really, I could do you a resume and put stuff on there, but it's not going to help you none. And we have to have a, right. a talk about that. That's one of those things where everybody's not going to do that. If they just want money. They're going to do you one and say, get out of my face. I try to right. interact with everybody I can. Even, I don't even, even with the, the subscriptions, a lot of times, I don't even always do a resume. I say, okay, what you got now? And then I just make comments and then, you know, they can go on their way and they can choose to fix it. If not, if they want me to do it, then we'll go from that because 
that takes time. But yeah, man, and specifically going on on Buddy that uh that wanted to feel press about that post one day because he talked about me and you, which was funny. That dude, yeah. I gave him, I gave him free info. I, I seen him. Um, shout out to Mary. I seen him in um in Mary's three at one time. And I reached out to him because Mary's busy. So I was like, and you know, I know that I am cheaper than her. It's not really undercutting. It's just I was like, I just reached out and say, like, hey, yo, I see you on there with the woo, you know what you're trying to do. He said, like, Yeah, I'm trying to do this. I was like, well, I sent him this stuff. And then I think another day I talked to him about something. And he was acting like he was gonna, you know, book or, or whatever. He never did. And not only have no problem with that, I've helped so many people. It's some people I've seen on LinkedIn, no lie. And I've just set up a call with them. Say, hey, let's go through your resume and stuff like that and talk. If you would just mm-hmm. say, like I said, you know, if you ain't got the money, just say it. I still probably work with you because you're trying to do something. Right. <laughs> Don't come. Like, you know, I wasn't trying to, <laughs> if I was trying to embarrass him, then I would have quoted him and said, if you ain't got the money, just say it. But it was more yeah. so replying to him just in, on my own thing. And then he came out of nowhere, you know, making it bigger than it had to be. And I was just like, come on bro i'm like really? yeah i think there's this context right i think there's this context that because black people have been so marginalized and you know we have to deal with so much stuff from the outside just the barriers of entry are just greater for us across the board um the statistics and i don't really care to quote statistics but the statistics say we're not supposed to be doing 90% 90% of the stuff we doing so I right. think when people see like black people in successful roles it's like all right well put me on because there's always a stigma and I've worked in organizations like this where there are black people who do gatekeep and they don't want to tell you how they got there and well I had to figure it out so so do you mm-hmm. so I think they've encountered those people or have seen that and they th- just think just because like I'm charging you for a call that doesn't mean I'm like that and that's what I said I'm like most of the people on here if you tell them like you know hey I don't have the money or hey you know can I do a payment plan people will work with you like just be upfront and be honest don't be you know making going on rants or like Angie was talking about like don't do stuff like that I know for me from five years ago when I was looking for information, it is completely different now. There is so much more free content. Like there are CBT Nugget instructors that have free content on YouTube. That did not exist five, six years ago. You had to pay, the, you had to pay. And at the time, CBT Nuggets was $100. You had to pay $100 a month to get those courses. So a lot of these places have, a lot of the big training sites have lowered their prices one. There's so much more free content on YouTube. And then you have Twitter where you can just tweet out a question. Hey, struggling with subnetting on CCNA, can somebody help? An hour later, you won't have 100, 200 replies of people saying, oh, well, you know, here's what helped me understand it, or here's this video. And then we have stuff like Udemy. Udemy wasn't running sales like they do now. Like it's a sale on Udemy every other day. So I know for me, and I put this on there, um, there's a CCIE bootcamp that I want to go to next year. That bootcamp is $5,000. Just the cost of the bootcamp, not even including if, because I don't know if the guy is going to keep it virtual, but if he doesn't, then that includes travel expenses. That doesn't include travel expenses. I'm not going to be on Twitter. Oh, F this dude, $5,000, I'm not paying that, da 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 I'm like, all right, I know I want to go to this. I know people who have taken this boot camp. They swear by it. They're very successful people. I trust their opinion. I'm going to start putting money away. My ultimate goal is to ask my employer to pay for it, but I'm not too sure they're going to. So I'm going to just put money away. Just in case. Just in case and pay for it because it's something that I know will help me. So you got to be willing to like invest in yourself. I'll take another example. Um, Bees is um, Success Life Society course. So I, I attended one. her free webinar. Yeah, I attended her free webinar about it. And I'm like, oh, like this is going to be dope. And I already, Bees had already proven her track record because 
she was already giving out so much free game and the stuff that I had applied worked. So I had the trust in her, but she dropped the price at the end of the webinar. And I'm like, oh no, I don't have that kind of money. So what did I do? I waited until she's like, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to reopen it and there are going to be payment plans. And I signed up for the payment plan. So when you don't have the money, you either have to, what I used to do was I'd look at the course, I'd go on YouTube and find corresponding videos on that topic and just kind of build my own like DIY course. So that was one way. Another way, wait for it to go on sale. Sometimes people have sales. Or, you know, what I started doing on Twitter was reaching out to people um, like, hey, you know, I really want to take your course, but, you know, I don't, you know, I can't afford it right now is, you know, are you planning to do a sale? Can I get on like a wait list or something? And some people would just be like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Take the course for free. So you just, you just never know until you ask, but immediately going to like bashing people is not the way to go. Thanks, because I'm supposed to be doing a review of it, but uh, it's a platform called Let's Defend. I, f- I found out about it while on LinkedIn or something like that, but I was reaching out through Twitter and they weren't responding. Then I found an email, emailed them. Dude replied and gave me like the premium membership to it, you know, for free because I laid out, you know, I was like, well, I got this amount of followers, this and that. I can you know, bring exposure to you. Well, it was the fact that I asked, you know, I could have paid for it, but that was the same thing. It's like, you know, if you don't, you have not because you ask not, like, like it says. And right. just like you said, not by complaining, I think I made, I was like, man, I'm not going to go to Mercedes and complain about the price of AMGs. I'm not the target customer. If, mm-hmm. I, if I don't have the money, it, it's, it's not for me. And I tell people a lot of times about that, like, you know, just relax, you know, get your money up. You know, everybody ain't start out this way. <laughs> and look, if anything, I would have, what was that, years ago, I probably would have paid whatever if somebody could have helped me get to where I want to go. Like, imagine, so I, I told Just like mapping out a plan. Something Thanks. as simple like, as that. Like, I was, was like last month, or whatever, right before I moved back to Dallas, I had a um, client, shout out to Carlos. He's going to be on here soon too. He was an IT support. Within two weeks, tweaks to resume, some interview tips and stuff like that. He got his first sock job. He paid only $30 for the subscription, which I told him, after he got the you know, offer, I said, dude, you can cancel. You know, my job, I'm not trying to keep you on the hook for 30. Mm-hmm. And I was like, paid 30 bucks and got almost a $35,000 a year increase in salary. So people complain, but I'm like, you can't, you know, you can't beat that math. And I, I and just don't you understand. Compare, right. And when you compare the services that people on Twitter are providing, like resume writing, um, interview prep, all of that type of stuff, the professional or the career resume writers and stuff, they're charging three, four times what people on Twitter are charging. And you got to pay that up front or they're not working. So, Thanks. And most of them not even in the industry. Right. Like, at least with me, like, if I'm saying, I was like, cool, I put this on here, but you need to learn how to do this, this, and this. Or I'm connected in a, a such a way now. Uh, I had uh, one of my clients interview with some role but I have a friend who's a uh she's either an assessor or an ISO or whatever I reached out to her about some mm-hmm. stuff and I got him some information he didn't have so I'm like a lot you just got to not focus on the price and think about in the long run you know what eventually you could gain from reaching out to people that's the reason why my LinkedIn is I was like you know I don't have to lie you can go check my LinkedIn check my recommendations uh, see who follows me you know, if, if this person vouches for me, I'll, you know, I vouch for them as, as you know, you know, I'm not talking about, you go to the content, you know, I ain't going to BS you, you know, it's crazy. Then what's also funny is you have people <laughs> who aren't in and then they start hating. Like, uh, I remember that time a girl didn't know what she was talking about. Just started talking about Mary stuff. <laughs> and it was hilarious. A lot of laughing at it. Cause I was like, what are you talking about? Do you, she, she found some type of course or something from harvard or, or somewhere 
Yeah. That wasn't even on the same part of what she was offering. And then right. fast forward a week or two later, she had a girl that did the boot camp was like, hey, I just got a position and this and that. And Mary was petty, was like, yeah, but I'm a scammer though. Yeah, I mean, like at her boot camps, you get a voucher for whatever the exam is. That right there alone puts her above a lot of other like boot camp services because you take a boot camp at like places like Global Knowledge, that's two, three thousand dollars for a week of whatever certification or whatever technology they're covering. And that's all you get. You get a certificate at the end that says you completed the course and you go on your way. And that's two or three thousand dollars. And I mean, it's absolutely still some stuff that I'm like, like sayings. I'm not paying for anything sayings. I Man, applaud hey, people who do. Expensive, bro. Uh, I'm a, I'm gonna wait until like work can pay for that. But I'm also not. Let me get the great pay. value sayings. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be bashing. Like, saying that like, I'm just not. I, I just know that's not something I'm going to pay for. So out of my pocket. But yeah, I just think people, they don't really see the value. It's a couple of things. They don't really see the value in the stuff because they think, oh, I can go find it cheaper. But sometimes cheaper isn't always the best way to go because you're cutting out other good like with this example the course she found yeah it's going to teach you the information but you're not getting no voucher at the end you're not getting resume help you're not getting job prep help so if all you care about is just the information and I've done this too I've looked at like courses and I'm like I've looked at everything they're offered and I'm like you know what I just really need to understand this enough to be able to speak the language at work so that I would go for like the cheaper or like the free course. If it's something where I'm like, I really need to be able to ask questions and, you know, better understand how to implement this. I'm going to go where I can get like the live help. Um, So you just really got to, and this goes back to having a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're just going to be throwing darts and hoping something hits. And that can be very costly, both in time and money. The money you will probably make back, but the time, no. Yeah. And time is the most expensive thing that, you know, you pretty much are paying for when it comes to somebody. I mean, yeah. and it's, let me see, what else do we, do we have that I was going to bring up that, oh, I know what I don't like. I don't like, it's actually like, this is kind of petty, but funny. Somebody will get one cert and then they'll change their Twitter name to something that make it seem like they're an expert or something. I don't like that. I I don't like um, fairly entry-level people talking as if they have X amount of experience and trying to give mm-hmm. advice because you hadn't did enough to be able to do that for people. You hadn't seen enough. I don't like that. We see that a lot. I'm like, you know. And they're charging. They're charging people for it. Yeah. They're charging people for it. And it's like, you've been in tech six months. At this point, you can talk about your path and like, you know, what you did. But anything after that, you just don't have... You can pretty much take it from the standpoint of talking about it as you go versus people who have been in it five or 10 years. It's like, all right, you yourself, yeah. have, I've made a ton of mistakes that, um, you know, I feel like slowed me down, but you can then come at it from the standpoint of here's what I did wrong. And here's how I knew I was doing it wrong. Here's how to spot like a shitty company um from like actual experience because I think we all hear the oh you know we're a family and the perks and all of that but some of that stuff is like really underlying like you'll just go into an organization like how do you know let me choose my words carefully so I was in a predominantly black organization by everyone's standard you know it didn't seem catty or you know negative or anything like that but I was like hitting a wall and come to find out there's like a lot of petty like backdoor undercurrent office politics that for a newbie 
you just don't recognize it until either one, somebody pulls you aside and be like, here's what's going on. Or two, yeah. you didn't been in it for a while. Like you just wouldn't recognize it from the outside. They just look, you know, they're professional and they're buttoned up and it's like, yay, black people, but you're not seeing the undercurrent. And then it's, it gets even worse in predominantly white spaces where they're not, where it's like a little bit more covert office politics and you you don't have the experience just coming in or six months in to really know, like you might feel something's off, but you don't really know how to go in and kind of navigate it and kind of get the information you need to know without coming off like overly um, nosy. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. Cause I know like, for example, when I was talking about the situation in my very first position, the recruiter, I was cool with because anytime I apply for some internal, she like she let me know who was who was recruiting for that, or she passed me on to get called. She told me verbatim, "Hey, yeah, they stopped your interview from happening because at the time they were stopping interviews, which they could have explained to us about we couldn't leave right. because the OPM hack and it was gonna be hard to get clearances in. If you would explain that to me, I would have been totally you no know, understanding, but you didn't understand." explain that to me and so you stopped my my interview then when I confronted you about it you act like you didn't know mm-hmm. I felt like um what's his name you ever seen lean on me mm-hmm. when he went when he went in there and flipped that desk over I, I contemplated yep. doing that but I was like <laughs> I might go to jail but th- that's how I was feeling at the time and it was like bro but see what I didn't know then what I know now is like recently I reached out to uh HR and I was like Hey, what what's the projection path after uh, senior analyst, whatever? And she was like, okay, is this? And I was like, what's you know, what's the entry part and what's the median range of you know this salary? And she told me. So now I have all the information I need to get to my manager, which you already talked about. I was like, well, look, I know what it, this 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 is, right. and you know which it's already a good sign because when I reached out to her, she was like, oh, so-and-so speaks so highly of you. Okay, bet. We're going to see how highly when it comes when I need this thing. <laughs> if not, right. you know, if not, I'm going to be like this. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to be like the baby. But that's one thing I didn't know. So guys, you can do that in your organization. If you feel like you're getting like underpaid or something like that, granted, now they may play not play ball with you, not tell you, but for a, a decent company, they should let you know those things. Um, right. Because a lot of people don't, they don't tell people what they make. I know what people are getting because I'm sending in on the things of what people are getting offered. And ah, man, one of my new teammates is, he, he's a very special guy. Maybe we'll do another uh, episode where we talk about him if he comes on. But that's just, that's just one way of knowing how to navigate something now that I didn't know how to do back then because I just was yeah. mad that y'all was costing me money and it wasn't even a lot more money but at the same time I was just trying to get out from phones man like you said <laughs> like you said your first role you mastered everything you did and now you want to do some more that's how I was the, everybody ran in the expectation of doing help this the recruiters for the contract told us oh yeah within six months you can go do xyz mm-hmm. not to take the test determined that was a lie we wasn't able to do yep. that. We were stuck. Um, it was only one dude successful. He left within like two weeks. Like, man, I ain't finna stay on these phones. And his recruiting company got him out of there. He was lucky. Mm-hmm. So everybody else was whatever. And that specific dude, pretty much, I was going to do uh, messaging. So I was going to be working with like the, I wanted to work with like uh, exchange services like that just to get out of hell this. I ain't really care. And he pretty much was like, yeah, you're shoe in. And talk to the hiring manager because he was a, man, a lead or a manager over there, but they prevented me from going. I was like, bro, so y'all play on my money? And I was like, I got y'all. Yep. And they I was mean, lucky. look at the recruiter. No, like, go ahead. No, I was going to say, look at the recruiter who tweeted out how she was doing a reference check for somebody and they called the person's previous manager who gave them a terrible review. And she said she called him to tell him don't ever use that person as a reference again. And people actually was like kind of side eyeing her for that. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> why wouldn't you want somebody to tell you that? Right. Um, and that was something I ran into, and I didn't know until somebody happened to be like, "Yo, don't use her like ever again." 
Yeah, it's I only friend. I only use people that I'm actually cool and friends with at work. Oh, I'm not yeah. really at work with people I know. If I text you, I have your number, I use you. We all, you know, use mm -hmm. each other. Anybody else, I'm not using you because I don't know you like that. You might be dry hating and you just want to hate. <laughs> so I'm like, nah, you can't, you can't be my reference. And um, man, it's just so much crap that I think this is this is a you're giving me some, you know what? You're giving me some some gems and stuff like that because that's a good video. I think I need to start a series yeah. of playlists on me like things they don't teach you in college. Cause that's what I preference when I posted the last video to LinkedIn. It was something as simple as like, you know, not, you know, living above your means with your new tech salary. Like that's the kind of stuff we need to know when and coming out of college about like oh, yeah. recruiters, and applying to jobs and other things to look for. That's what we know. Cause a lot of us don't have us as mentors going into a new job to like, hey, let me give you the game right now. You're sometimes you're stuck until you meet somebody that kind of shows you how to get mm -hmm. where you need to go. So you just just you're putting a lot of energy into the wrong way of trying to leave. And it's right. and I've been there. I'm talking about man, listen, that's why I tell people now networking is like the best thing you can do. Um just mm -hmm. network 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 you just never know i tell people to use linkedin so much just because of you never know what hiring manager somebody's looking at what you said on somebody else's thread uh shout out to Antoine right. matthews on one of my podcasts uh, i think the manager he works for now saw him talking about saying that pen test plus was an easy test <laughs> and uh, he said that in the interview and i so that's why i tell people say hey man you never know who's watching what you say so just, you know, get your stuff off, just show people you're inclined, you're working and you're learning. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I tell people now, hey, do something like a blog or whatever, as cliche as it is, like now when you refer people to your companies, they have links on there. So, hey, do they have any of the links where they, you know, they do work or something like that on there? And yeah. if um, a manager that, seeing that you do that, my job. see, exactly. Because if a manager sees you doing this, okay, this guy's ambitious. I'm going to tell you, it sucks working with people that just show up. Or it's some stuff going on and y'all asking in the meeting and then they quiet, but then the next day, they still messing up. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, bruh. <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't, I also don't agree with the whole like fake it till you make it mindset. Like, no. Do not fake it. Do not lie on your resume. Cause, and I think, um, what's his name? Joe, he does, he used to do like the black tech, the black Twitter, the black tech talks on Clubhouse. Um, but he was just saying like, he lied on his resume. He went in an interview and just got destroyed. So <laughs> I'd be seeing people like, put AW. <laughs> They put in like AWS on a resume and only got like a cloud practitioner. Like, don't don't do that. It's okay. Be honest. Be upfront. Thanks. I call don't that overselling you yourself. <laughs> I, I call mm -hmm. overselling yourself. I, I did that before in the interview. Uh, I had like I put almost every platform I had ever logged into at work on there, even though I couldn't talk about them. And people started mm -hmm. asking me, it's like, oh, what did you use Exedium for? Oh, what did you use Anacam for? I was like. Well, you know, and I just, I was looking stupid. And that's yeah. one of the things I talked about in, in one of my videos. And um, mm -hmm. for people, so guys, when you get an entry level cert, you really can't claim that you know a lot about, you know, that platform. But what you can say is like, you can put some alongside, you have like AWS knowledge or there's some other ways you can jazz it up. But once they see that, you know, you yep. can kind of go in there and talk about some of the things you learn while wow, studying for that that test and they'll like that better than you trying to claim that you know you have a uh, solutions architect knowledge and you don't have cloud practitioner experience right and people and tend i'll to give you that. like a real yeah i'll give you a real example for me um i don't have a lot of routing experience um it just hasn't been something i've had to work on in the organizations i've been in um 
it's been more of like a set it and kind of forget it type thing. So I know for a fact, my routing knowledge is a little bit weak. Um, but what I do know is some basic troubleshooting steps for different routing protocols. So when something has been down, usually when I need to call an ISP, I know how to run, um, you know, show BGP neighbors and read through the neighbor relationship status. So I know enough to know like, okay, hey, Comcast, um, the service is down. We're not getting any routes from your router. Can you take a look at it? And, you know, it's pretty much basically there. And I put that on my resume, like, you know, troubleshooting knowledge and people will see it and be like, okay, well, what does this mean? I'm like, well, um, I can't, I don't have the experience of like setting it up out the box, but if it's already up and running, I can at least say like, okay, I, I see a problem here and escalate it from there. Um, and with that being said, I'm now spending time diving a little bit more into routing because I'm getting to the point in my career where it is costing me money not to have <laughs> that experience, but other people are like, oh, just put it on your resume. Like, nope, you won't have me yep. in an interview. Like, nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And with me, you know, interviewing uh, last year, early this year, I knew one of my weaknesses was like the second part of incident response, just because at work, I do most of the front part, and then we pass it off to the their internal IR team. So it was like, I know how to do the stuff, but I don't do it. So I've always been getting questions asked about that. Like one time, matter of fact, I had a, a job um, actually, me and I think me and Day Spring interviewed for them. Shout out to Day Cyberwalks. Um, they asked me what I would do in a ransomware thing. This and that. I'm talking about I give these people a long, drawn out thing just for them to waste my time after the process, which is why I'm bullish on like, I, I tell my clients, hey man, treat their job search like dating. Mm -hmm. Um, and I tell them to go about it in the strength of kind of like how men do, especially like probably like arrogant, confident men. Whereas, you know, we utilize our leverage on you all a lot um, to let you know that, hey, we don't really need you in the beginning stages, right? Because if the guy you're viewing is not a sought out option, or if you're a company and not really a sought out person, you're just going to treat them how you want to. Like, right. Talking to Dayspring a couple of weeks ago, he was like, man, recruiter called me and she was being like real condescending, bro, and saying all this other stuff. But as soon as I was like, yeah, I'm, I got some offers on the table already, she perked up and changed her attitude. I said, right, because she felt like she could mm -hmm. do whatever you want because she thinks you need them. Man. No, but it's flipped. The tables are turned. And it's also why I tell people to take open to work off their profiles on LinkedIn. I haven't seen people get hired with open to work on their profile. I just always see it open to work. Yeah, it looks like, hey, I'm desperate for a job. I'll, you know, you could pay me anything, which that very well yeah. may be the case, but you got to have a poker face on it and play the game right. Yeah, because jobs know who they can play with. Like, it's just in the job search and on the job. Like, you'll see they know. They know who they value. And I will say sometimes and I've been in these situations where you contribute a lot and it's just not appreciated. And then when you're ready to go, it's like, no, no, please stay. Whereas other people who don't contribute as much or just are skating by, it's like, you know, I've seen people even get mad, like, oh, they ain't even asked me, they ain't even counter offer. Well, why would they? You just show up and make more work for the rest of us. <laughs> not, um, so yeah, they know. And you really have to just be confident. And I think this is why, um, especially like a lot of women, they struggle with like imposter syndrome because, and I think some, some, there was a tweet that was saying that like, you know, we shouldn't be, we should talk about the positives as of working in tech as women more, because we're going to scare people off, which I don't agree with, um, but what I will say is people do sometimes take that and it just makes their imposter syndrome worse instead of listening to the advice that like people are given. Like you're still going to have to deal with um, tech bros. And if you're black, some level of racism and gatekeeping around that, 
but you just have to, again, like have your plan and work your plan. And a lot of times I've like left organizations because it was just too mentally stressful. Like it was good money, but it was just way too mentally stressful. It was too much going on. It was a lot of office politics. The work wasn't organized correctly. And I'm just like, you know what? I <laughs> you can't just stay in a role just because and you're miserable like I've seen people like crying in the bathroom like no Never please go somewhere this. else hey look look y'all gotta be listen women listen to me uh, my black ladies in, in tech y'all gotta be like future at these jobs man you know or even like you know in the words of um Lori Harvey Roger Davis <laughs> three and three you know jobs are like buses miss one next 15 one coming you know, it's going to always mm-hmm. be another job out there that will treat you right. Um, one of the things that I, um, unfortunately, um, you already tied into the question about, you know, ask about stuff you experience as a Black woman in tech. One of the things I hate is that it's not a lot of times where, like, somebody like me and you will be paired up on the same team. Because I'm the type of guy that uh, I'm for, for fairness for everybody. And so if somebody's doing somebody wrong, I don't like it. Like, even the situation with um one of my... Uh, co-workers now who's also my friend outside of work uh, she was on a contract with us and some stuff happened and they made her the fall person I didn't like that at all well she was part of the engineering side though so we're together but separate so on my team I would have had you know more to leverage but like you know this is not right you know whoop 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 because the people that got let go been messing up for years and it took years for them to go and then the mm-hmm. person who put their head down, do their work. And now all of a sudden you just want to blame them. I didn't like that at all. It's like, nah, that's, you know, that's not right. And the fact, you know, nobody could st- standing up for you to stand up like, nah, I don't, I don't agree with that. You know, y'all gotta, they gotta go on somebody or we all take the blame. You can't just blame them. It's y'all fault, right. you know? I, mm-hmm. I don't like that. No, I see that. I mean, of course I'm talking about tech, but I see it happening like all industries and, you know, it does. It sucks um, because I know a lot of women probably feel like, dang it, I might not get another one. I'm a, I'm a black woman, so I need to just kind of just do my job and, and not say nothing. Um, I've heard like, somebody say that. Like, I'm not going to be able to get another job paying this much. And it's just like, what? <laughs> like, you're good at your job. You know what you're doing. You will make way more than what you're making here. Um, Facts. And, be and that's happier. why you guys need to network. Just, just network with us, especially uh, with me. I always try to touch in with, with you know, well, all skin folk, you know, and can folk. But I, I try to find the ones that are. And um, the thing about my company is they have, they gave us our own network for us to just talk about, you know, black issues, and even gave a scholarship for that. So that's pretty dope in itself. Now. Whether they really care or not, I don't care. But you know, you can't beat free money. So I, I don't care about that. Yeah. But it's the fact you do have a chance for a space for all of us to get together and talk. Um, a lot of companies don't have that. So I believe that's definitely something unique in itself. Um, but so I got a question. Yeah, go kind ahead. Kind of related to that. How do you feel about companies that kind of just put like the DNI work on their black employees versus? having like a true like DNI DNI team. Yeah, you know, I see that a lot. And you know what's funny? Most of the time those roles go to black women. Mm-hmm. And I haven't looked into it um as much. And also I really never studied what besides diversity and inclusion, including like me having like diverse people like in a, a corporation. I really haven't researched it enough to really understand everything that comes with that 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 role um me personally i feel like if you are going to have a, a dni division then it needs to be made up of every you know type of people that you have at a company with a black white asian trans mm-hmm. you know you name it because all the different people are going to understand, you know, the fact that I say, you know, their people and how to handle them and what, what don't, don't do this, don't say this. That's what I would do. If you're just going to put it all on one person, it, it's not going to work good. And I, I feel like they do try to push that off on them saying, oh, well, 
Mm -hmm. Well, here, do this. And I'm like, because I always notice that. I, I do notice that. When I looked at diversity and inclusion, most of them may have just put, put the, the Black woman up there. And I'm like, hmm. So that's definitely something for me to to actually to research. Because I'm trying to see. Yeah, I've seen. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, no, I've seen um like companies like they'll just have they either do it like I, they do it with women in tech too they'll just have like oh let's like start a club and like hey guys help us like understand your challenges so we can um, recruit better and some organizations actually take the information um, and use it and then others it's just like yeah it just becomes a selling point at the hiring fair like yeah we have a women in tech division and we have a black in tech group like but they're not really yeah. doing anything and they just kind of use it as like a selling point. And I, I saw some conversations on Twitter where it seems like that's growing, especially like kind of starting last year after everything that happened with George Floyd and everything. So I, I've seen people yeah. like, if you don't want to be a part of it, like speak up because <laughs> they will, they'll just yeah. stick you on there. Thanks. A lot of times I miss some of the meetings. Um, I do know like for, for ours, they do like we did spotlights. Like I shared when they spotlighted me um, on Twitter some months ago. So mm -hmm. I think that was pretty, pretty cool. But most of the time, I'm just like a person, I, I don't have to be, I don't, at this point, I don't care if it's genuine. Like I said, like, you know, as long as if it's a space is legitimate where, you know, share your grievances is cool. But before we go, guys, Anything you don't want your company to um, hear you talking about, do not put it on Slack or Teams or whatever messaging thing they use. If you got that person number, text it. Even then, be careful with that. But definitely don't put it in there yeah. because they can they can see that stuff. A lot of people probably think the, their messages are safe, but they're not. Um, no, they're you, definitely well, not. Well, I can't see this stuff, but the admin is definitely can see it on the back end because we can go so far as even, you know, we got access to the exchange where I can see if you click the link or not. So, yep. If you've ever been a part of le a legal discovery for whatever reason, they can pull all your messages, all your internet traffic, look at all your emails in and out. So, it's definitely all monitored and collected. <laughs> definitely. But, you know, I don't want to hold you the whole night, but this is like, you know, we might have to do this one. You might have to be a special guest, you know, every now and then, just because this was, uh, I like this, this was a conversation. And, you know, it didn't really seem like it was going as long as it's been going. So that's great. Uh, tell the people yeah, I just where looked they up could, and I'm like, oh. I just looked at the, the clock. They can reach and you like, oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know. Look at so, <laughs> um, so I'm at CCIE by 30 across all social media um my t youtube yeah that's ccie by 30 um my website is ccie by 30.com and yeah i'm most active on twitter i'm trying to pick up instagram a bit more i tried to do a reel that was terrible <laughs> <laughs> i can't get it um I'm, I'm gonna keep trying but yeah so i'm most active on twitter and i do uh weekly twitter spaces on thursday where we discuss a lot of the topics that came up here. Um, and How did I the, miss bringing it up? I knew I was missing something. <laughs> it's a new thing. Um, so we just talk about a lot of stuff geared towards um, people trying to enter the field. And then once you've already been in the field, like, you know, two to three years, your mid-level topics, they kind of come up once you're mid-level in your career. And I just kind of started those because I saw a lot of content being created for people to get into tech and then for people who are in tech to move into management. But there's not a lot of information out there for people who you just want to be a better analyst or engineer or, you know, just better at your job or just navigate it a little bit smarter. So that is my goal for Twitter spaces. Man, that's dope. That's dope, man. So, hey, if you guys been rocking with us, I appreciate you. Her information will be in the description box on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor, everywhere, you know, you can get at me. And, hey, we applying pressure all 2021. It's your boy, HD, 
and I'm out.